Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for West Valley Hot Topics. Uh, today, we have an especially hot topic that is on everyone's mind out there. Um, and whether you're a resident or you were um, in the commercial real estate market, you're looking at apartments going up, you like them, you don't like them, you're looking at rents going up, you're hearing about all this stuff in the newspaper, uh, on the news all the time and wondering, you know, what can we do and what, what is the right answer for our communities? So we're fortunate today to be joined by two experts, Mayor Eric Orsborn with the city of Buckeye, who has, um, from an elected perspective and running a city, has a, a lot of stake and Make it you know, balancing that, juggling that. You know, do we how much multifamily housing do we have? How much do we need? And what are the resident concerns? And the whole kit and caboodle that comes along with it. And Shelby Duplessis, who is uh, president um, with Empire Group of Companies, and she it actually builds these products. And so she's here to kind of debunk some of the myths that we hear about it and share with us. You know, who's actually living in these uh, in these homes. So um, thanks again for joining us. And, um, you know, one of the things that I saw today as I was driving in was a billboard on I-10 from the city of Dallas recruiting teachers with the pay range that's definitely higher than our teachers in Arizona. And so that tells me that you know, we really have to make sure that we're providing uh, a holistic community where our employees um, can can afford to live um, and they can afford the, the, you know, to the cost of, of living here. And so this all comes into play is the basic need of shelter, right? So, uh, Mayor, you know, for, do you want to kick us off with your perspective on what you're hearing, what you're seeing in the community, as well as maybe some of the committees that you're on regionally? Yeah, uh, so from a... Uh, from a multi-family, well, I guess a little bit of history on Buckeye. We, in the year 2000, were about 6,500 in population, and we have grown to, uh, now we're over 100, in fact, we're about 110,000 in population. So staggering growth over that time frame, and, uh, and not a lot of multi-family development over that time frame. It's been, the, the, uh, it's been all, uh, except for some small projects, uh, all single family residential. And, um, and what we're seeing is uh, now we're able to attract that multifamily out to Buckeye. It's not for lack of, of trying. Uh, it just hasn't been that right time to get multifamily to Buckeye. So Buckeye is 640 square miles uh, in our municipal planning area. Uh, Phoenix is 525 or somewhere around there. So much larger. Yeah, but it was, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it yeah, it's, it's a big uh, It's just a staggering amount of land that we're going to be growing into. Uh, and that's in all different housing types from uh, the executive housing that, that currently exists in Buckeye uh, to the affordable housing that's coming in or starter homes or everything in between. So it's a... Uh, it's a vast array, and we're excited to start bringing on that multifamily in. What we are hearing from a uh, an affordability perspective, uh, and, and in fact, we have uh, kids who said it gave you some warning, and I wasn't very good at giving you warning. The <laughs> slide, first slide that uh, that we brought with us today, just gives a little depiction of what's happened from 2017 to uh, to now in the city of Buckeye. And that this slide right here, uh, single family median resale home price in 2017 was 203,000. Now uh, the median is 435. So it's a 114% change. Uh, and, and then the, the new home price has gone from 235 to 410. That's a 74% change. And, uh, and salaries have not raised 74% or uh, or 114 percent, and then the other thing to look at is the apartment rent. If you go go back to that, uh, that apartment rent is uh, it is up 47 percent, and it's uh, it, part of that is just a lack of options in the, the city of Buckeye. But I think it's that overall, not only from that supply demand issue, but just because in general uh, costs are going up. So we'll see a. I think an exponential rise in rents as as we have a difficult time meeting that demand that is out there uh, 
uh, for single family homes. But uh, but that's I, I guess I'm going to spend all my slides right now. Uh, if you go to the next slide, that affordability uh, conversation. Here is a, a slide that was provided by Elliot Pollock and Home EZ, who uh, are very happy to take this show out on the road and explain. Uh, here are the, the uh, affordability issues that we're seeing coming up in the market economy. And that red you see is, uh, is people who are not able to either afford rent or purchase of a, of a new home or, or any type of, of dwelling unit. That's in 2021. As you get to the, the next slide, uh, that shows that uh, really there isn't anybody uh, in 2022 who is that, that makes $86,000 or less that is able to purchase a home. And that puts everybody in the rent category. And the yellow is who is able to rent a, a two bedroom. Uh, the red gets into maybe renting a, it's kind of hard to tell, but the orange and the red, either maybe renting a one bedroom or not being able to afford any housing whatsoever. And, and that's a real issue um, in some of the other boards that I'm on. Obviously, we talk here about Westmark in the, uh, in the West Valley about uh, economic development and, and, uh, and then I'm on the GPEG board. We're talking about economic development at GPEC, and that's where I first heard Home AZ talk about uh, the really big issue we're, we're coming into as a uh, metropolitan area. We're becoming unaffordable, and that's really going to stall uh, economic development. Yeah, um, and you you brought up something really interest, interesting that we really don't think about, but really the, the communities in the East Valley and West Valley they really were uh, people that kind of drove out and they drove out for single family homes. And um, and then of course, Buckeye and some of the other communities on the edges definitely have that rural component to them. So how, how are folks adjusting to that change? Because we're not Central Phoenix, we're not used to seeing high rises. So what is that? Yeah, like? uh, I, think, I think it's on us as a city to really set that expectation. In some of these areas, we definitely are going to that, that very dense, built up, scaled up housing. We have six activity centers, we call it, throughout our uh, municipal planning area. And what I'm looking for those areas to be is that higher density, like a downtown Tempe or a downtown Phoenix. Uh, it's not gonna be the entire 640 square miles, but there's some significant areas that become these kind of nodes or, or, or activity centers where it's scaled up and you can expect to, uh, uh, but in a place that has multifamily, there's also single-family home options. Uh, to, but at the same time, that brings in a lot of that retail. That's where the, the heavy commercial is. And it's a really, really cool place to live. You think of the downtown. Uh, I mean, my wife and I go on these tours of the metropolitan Phoenix area and go hang out in downtown Phoenix for a little while. Or go hang out in on Mill Avenue or... Uh, uh, downtown Gilbert and, and uh, you know, give uh, Bridget Peterson some of our sales tax money. <laughs> or, or areas like Carolyn or Scottsdale Park. Those are incredible locations where you have this multifamily built up in this mixed use that uh, I think I think there's a, a connotation that, that uh, multifamily only exists as these apartments that I grew up near as a kid, and right. it's not what I want to live near now. And, um, and I think multifamily overall comes in all different types of forms, uh, but there's some really, really cool opportunities that we're going to build into as we build the city of Buckeye. So, so Shelby, talk about those different forms. I mean, that was a perfect lead-in. It was perfect. We didn't yes. that. Right. I know, right? That was perfect. Um, I think that to the mayor's point, everything has its right fit in the right location. And so um, many of you already know that we do high rises in downtown Phoenix. I would never propose a high rise in Buckeye, but not yet. not yet, right? But you're right, not yet, but it'll come. And so the timing, as you talked about earlier, it's here now. And so there's so many things that we can talk about today, including the demand. Uh, we have a very strong shortage 
of demand or of uh, availability. And so we have not focused on multifamily in the metropolitan Phoenix area um, as we should have been maybe in the last 20 years. So we're, we're way behind. And a lot of constituents and neighbors get very upset when we start talking about multifamily. Um, they, they maybe were fortunate enough to never have to live in an apartment. I wasn't fortunate in that way. Um, my children live in apartments. I don't want them to have to move out of Arizona. Um, I want them to be able to stay in Arizona. Um, but we're also seeing, because of the recession, a choice of living, um, to the mayor's point, of going downtown Phoenix and going into Scottsdale, Carolyn area. We're seeing a lot of people empty nesting and actually wanting to live in that type of community. And so what we build and what we'll talk about today is those choices, because everyone wants choices. Um, so we're working on those choices. These are very high-end homes that people are choosing to live in. Um, I won't talk about some of the, the tenants that we have today that a lot of you today watching know personally that are in our build for rent communities. Um, I don't want to give up where they live, so I won't say that today. But the, it's choices of where they want to live and still being able to live in one day. We're still being able to live in the West Valley and being able to afford to, to do that. And so that's where we're focused right now is what we need, which is a shortage of homes and choices. Um, and also what is the right fit and where do we start with and then working with the neighbors. It's a lot of education right now. People are fearful of multifamily and they don't need to be. For us, every wheelhouse is different. We don't do affordable housing, um, but we need it. Um, I can't put my children in one of our, our communities. We've tried and it just doesn't work. Um, our minimum income right now, household income is 75,000. And to your slide point earlier, it's going to continue to increase uh, with gas prices up so high, materials, shortages, um, and demand. Uh, we cannot build fast enough. We're doing now what we call sequencing, where we're actually opening communities before the construction is completed and giving lease reductions because these people don't have any place to go and want to move in while construction is still happening in the community where they don't maybe have amenities to use right out of the gate so they get that reduction, but it allows us to give them a home to live in while we're finishing the construction. Um, so there's a lot today I think that we can talk about and, and how we try to start all working together as communities to solve this, how to, this housing shortage and at the same point, the economic development and how we continue to allow that economic development. We can't do that if we don't have houses. Um, I don't know how many calls I get in a week because of the new Taiwan plant up in North Phoenix and where is everyone going to live and getting special concessions with Phoenix on how quickly we can get these built because they need them faster than we're able to build them. Every day it's something different. Last week it was um, windows. Uh, we have truckloads of windows that we just went and secured and are bringing them in. We have people down in Mexico right now trying to buy bags of cement because we don't have any cement right now to mix and continue pouring sidewalks so we can get people moved into these communities. And just today I heard that we're short because of the cement shortage on tiles for the top of them. And so how do we morph to that? How do we work through those issues? But at the same time, still keep building because people are needing homes and there's still approximately 111,000 people a, a year moving into the Phoenix metropolitan area. And so how do we manage that? And how do we continue to have housing so that we can keep not only our children, but our workforce here, our teachers and um, people that can't afford some of those other homes, but we need them in our community to thrive. Yeah. Mayor, I liked your slides because it actually showed who's living and what they can yeah. afford. And these are the people in our neighborhood. Right. These are the people that we need, that they're essential workers or teachers, like we, you know, mentioned earlier. And so I think that's, that's, this is a housing crisis. Yeah. I think so. And I, I think that's a snapshot of it, sir. I think that it, if you go to other areas that uh, that have some of those multifamily options that are maybe more high end, uh, it's it's for doctors or it's business owners or it's people that choose that that last. In fact, I talked to a business owner today that moved from Verona to downtown Phoenix and lived in a high rise down. That, that is so cool. It's, you know, someday. Uh, my wife Tina and I talk about wouldn't it be cool to just have options of, of uh, where you live and, and to have that option a high end uh, multifamily development where you could live within the city of Buckeye. Uh, that, that would be phenomenal. 
and, yeah. and have all of that stuff that you can walk to, whether it's work or restaurants or recreation opportunities or you, you name it. So, I mean, yeah. that the multifamily really has that negative connotation, but it, it spans the gamut of, from the very affordable to luxury uh, and it's some very special places that you could call. Yeah, and and the incomes of the people that are living there. I mean, I know you're hesitant to say it, but there's a there's a West Valley City manager that lives in in um, in one of uh, Shelby's projects, and actually she puts that information in slides, so I know I can without saying her name. I know I gotta say it because she shares that that hey, I'm I'm one of those people. Yeah. So um, it is you know back to you know that getting rid of that fear, and and you're right, the black people forget that. At some point, they lived in an apartment, and so they you know, lived in an apartment in their know, twenties, yes. yeah. or a mom's house. It was so, so you have the, the city manager, and from that affordability aspect, uh, Mayor Weiss talks all the time about his daughter, who is college educated, is out with her her first uh, jobs, and and can't afford the a home for sure, and is uh, having a difficult time finding apartments that are. Uh, reasonable to, to move right. into. So um, it's, it expands the gamut. It, it, the talk about economic development and how that affects, we have this small battery manufacturer that's uh, coming into Buckley, Right, we heard about that uh, one. Core Power, who is going to do phenomenal things out there. And it's going to bring 3,000 jobs to the downtown area of Buckeye. Uh, but ultimately, that area, that ecosystem they're going to build, the Sustainable Valley, has upwards of 10,000 jobs. And those are folks that are not all coming out to buy a home, um, but they're part of that people that exist in the Valley now are that 111,000 that are moving in every year that need a place to live if Core Power is gonna be able to attract employees from other states to uh, to yeah. Arizona or to Buckeye to, to come to work. And if there's no place for people to live, uh, and so one of the, the points that Home AC and Elliot Pollock could drove home is we can, you know, high five each other in the in the hallways when we land these big economic development projects and, and we're doing that. But if we don't figure out housing and how to get more of this product into uh, in, in, into the market uh, to meet that demand, it's going to be very difficult uh, to say that we are an affordable option. Um, for businesses relocating. Yeah, and, and you're spot on. I mean, that's something that we've been talking about at the West Market Economic Development Committee for the same reason. The high five when you land a project, right. but for a number of years now, West has been entrenched in, in workforce um, right. and developing the workforce and promoting the workforce in the West Valley. And now, while we're still in that lane very much so, it's changed because now we have much more of a workforce shortage. So we're going, yeah, we had an awesome project. Do we have the workforce for it? And then we start peeling it back. Um, in May, we had our economic development summit that focused in on workforce, but we peel the issue back to including the discussion on multifamily housing and transportation, because, you know, do we have all the elements to get that workforce here? So uh, those things are really important. Um, and, you know, you bring up a good point. You have, we have all these new companies that are coming in and employees that are coming and migrating to the state do they want to make a purchase right away? They may be able to afford it, but I know for me, I kind of want to check out the lay of the land a little bit before I determine where I want to make a hard investment. So having these options are so important for our community. And, and even if they do want to purchase a home as soon as they get here, if it's not a resale home, you're, you're almost a year before you can get into that home. So they need a place to stay in the meantime. Yeah. And, and that, you know, getting to know a community and moving in and having the opportunity to live in a place and kind of get the feel of the community. And with in Ferrata, the lofts that are up above Bashes, that's there are a lot of people that, that move into there while their home is being completed somewhere within the community, just so they can start to integrate into the uh, into that uh, community and into that lifestyle out there. Yeah. And if you don't have that opportunity, then those people are living someplace else. Uh, and not in your community. And we keep saying Buckeye and Taylor to Buckeye. It's not just a Buckeye thing, but a West Valley thing uh, for Westmark. And it's it's an entire Metro Phoenix uh, issue that we have to contend. Yeah. Um, one of the CEOs from uh, 
past CEO at Fort Brazo West Campus, um, when she moved to the area, she rented the apartment right around the corner from me because she was trying to, you know, figure out where am I going to live? And then she had to wait for the house to close and, and so on. So again, it goes back to these are the people that are really living in our neighborhoods. Um, and one of the things, and, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about this, Shelby, is um, the densities, right? The importance of the densities, because you work in overall commercial development. So you understand that need that, you know, we want the cool restaurants. We want all these things in our neighborhood. Um, there was that recent project in the city of Peoria that, again, really great project, great amenities, and you dealt with a lot of the neighborhood issues within that region. Um, but again, it takes densities to get those types of, of restaurants and just, you know, foot traffic in. And so I think um, back to the mayor's point of walkability and having those type of developments, that Peoria project that you're referencing, Trailhead, is a phenomenal project. And so that's bringing in Fox Restaurants, um, who is actually signing a lease outside of even having zoning in place um, to be able to come to the West Valley, which was unheard of and a challenge for any of us to get them here. And so they need those rooftops and they need those type of renters, if you will, to support and be able to afford to go to their restaurants. And so with that, we see it's not even just not being able to buy a home or getting to know a community. We have seen a change, a huge change in choice. Our number one renter right now is actually a mid 40s single female that has gone through a divorce and feels secure living in a gated community. That is 42% of our renter right now is someone like that that has the little community pods in our build for rent scenario where they're in a gated community all of their amenities are afforded to them. It's a true turnkey home. And I think you see a lot of people that came out of the recession, myself included, that lost a lot or a lot of change and a lot of conservatism now of these cycles that we live in and not to have to be home for. And it is expensive to own a home, but not only is it expensive, it's time consuming. All of the maintenance, all of the work and people we see are wanting to leave on Fridays and come back on Sundays. But that they then now they can't clean their pool and mow their lawn or or maybe trim their plants or what have you. They want to just have the turnkey where these built for rents afford that opportunity and actually help, as you said, since with the density. We you know, most of our competitors are at about 12 units per acre. We're a little bit less. We're about 10 and a half because of the amenities we like to provide within our community. Um, and we like the um, comfort, it lives better um, with all of the spaciousness. Um, between the units, but still even at 10 and a half units per acre, you're getting a, a significant number of units and we look at pedestrian connectivity and how we best work with our surrounding commercial centers and how we make that walkable so they can actually go right next door and walk over or ride their bike for dinner or um, entertainment of sorts. And so really looking at all of those options too. And I think that that will help us hopefully with neighbors to understand that that's helping them too. Those number of homes is helping bring commercial developments, whether it be grocers, things that they really want, but those those commercial developers look at number of rooftops when sure. they do their analysis. Sure. And that's the that's such a disconnect. You've got such some, some visuals on what that looks like inside. Do you want to show us? Oh sure. Yeah, our slide towards the um, back end of the slides. And just let me uh, say to our folks out there is if you have any questions for our panelists, please drop them in the chat and we will get them answered. Put them on the spot. Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. So we threw in a lot of uh, details. Here's the um, pictures of our list of amenities. Um, we actually will do our developments. We, we start from the very beginning of buying the dirt and have actually created a management team. So we actually own and operate all of our communities. And so we go back on a regular basis and meet with our our tenants, if you will, on our first site that opened in Goodyear um, in Glendale and now Peoria. Uh, we have 14 more sites in the West Valley in the works, um, including two in Buckeye. And we go back to all of our renters and find out what they need, what, what are they missing. Um, one of them was a car station of uh, just having a work area to be able to work on your car and wash your car under a canopy and, and then working with the cities then at that same time of how do you capture that grease. Um, it's not a lot of grease, but, you know, just water runs off the car. And, and so how do we do that so that people can still feel like they have the same amenity um, packages and options they do in their own homes, 
but at the same time being able to rent. So um, the next few slides will just show what those pictures look like. Um, very high end um, interior decorating and um, a lot of amenities, raising our ceiling plates, putting in dog doors in every unit, uh, the fiber optics and being able to, a lot of people working from home, just making sure all of those technology packages are included. Um, creating more of an open feel, um, much like you see when you buy a home, where you have that open living with the, the entertaining area of the, the kitchen, living room, and um, dining room all connected. Um, just trying to work through some of the wood plank tiles and granite countertops, just so you feel like you're part of a home that you would have bought, um, but instead it's something like renting so you don't feel displaced um, in another room. A lot of work on our amenities outside, whether it be our community center and our pools, having gathering areas. Uh, we now put in charging stations at all of those lounge chairs um, because we find that, again, people are working outside, both at the community center and the pool. So I just got a question. How do you come up with these amenities that people are looking for? Are they surveying? Yep, are we're you surveying them? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, and, and we're very friendly with all of our competitors. So um, I think it was True Live that first built the car care station. And we said, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. Um, and so we start incorporating that, but it's really our tenants. Going back, um, this is our first dog park, for example, that we built. Well, that dog park was really hard to maintain. It's in good year um, because of all of the dogs that were out there that were trampling the grass. Um, and it was getting wet on, obviously. And, and so we were having a hard time keeping it that green. Um, so we're now putting in artificial turf, but then there's the concern of how do you keep their paws from getting too hot? So now we're putting in a canopy um, and now we're putting in mister system. So when they go in, they can actually miss the lawn if they want to before their dog goes outside. And then with that, there's uh, feeding and water bowls, um, just um, out, uh, like a water fountain there for them. And then in the back that you don't see is actually a grooming and pet washing area. Yes. So you can, yes, take care of your dogs and not bring them into your bathtub in your home. So I walked my dogs by that project one <laughs> time and I heard about that. And we're like, can we get in there and wash our dogs? <laughs> I think you'd be when I took them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we did talk about it. It's like, how do you do this? Because we walk right by there all the time. Uh, we've expanded our, our fitness facility. We heard of equipment that um, some of our renters wanted. and. And so we, we needed to increase that area. So, yeah, we take a lot of time meeting with our, uh, our tenants to find out what's working, what's not. That city manager that you mentioned, uh, one of her comments was that our closets don't have a full ring for her to hang her dresses. We're like, oh, my gosh, brilliant. So we go back and change our closets. Um, and so we just feel like we keep improving the model. Um, we're using the ceiling plates. So you have more light and uh, just different things people feel. Yeah. Awesome. So how do you work with the cities too? Because again, you know, every multifamily project, you know, Mayor, you talk a little bit about the community pushback and some of the calls that you get. And Shelby, how do you manage? I mean, this is a conversation for the two of you. Yeah. How do you manage that making the mayor feel comfortable because he's yes. got constituents that says not no, but hell no. And, you know, how do you both deal with that. So that's my favorite part of the job, actually. <laughs> and so that's when we obviously, and I used to bring my kids with me to those meetings. I don't anymore. They're older now. They're 19 and 23. Saw them. No, that's <laughs> theirs with the neighbors. And oh. my kids would come home upset because they were so mad at me. And I said, oh, that's just part of what I do, though. And I call it the venting meeting. So I have a venting meeting with the neighbors first. They, they don't like change and they don't know us. And they are scared of change. They're scared of us being that nasty developer. I have made so many friends through this business now from just sitting at the table and listening. What are they really worried about? What could we do to provide more buffer? Could we put in Goodyear? We ended up putting a tree in the backyard of every home because of um, the Pebble Creek neighbors. They were so worried that it was going to look like too many rooftops. We moved our three bedroom units along the perimeter so you don't see as many homes because they're larger. Um, we can do so many different things. Um, and just figuring out each community my team at the office hates that probably the most about us because every single project is different. Um, obviously, the best model um, economically is to do cookie cutter, right? You just reduplicate. You take your community and you drop it. We don't do that ever. Um, we change. Oh, gosh. After we even sold our Goodyear site, 
we ended up going back and repainting the wall and putting in more trees just because the neighbors disliked it. And we just want to make sure that we are remembered as the developer that was friendly, kept our word, and worked with them and really understood. A lot of times, it's just understanding. And a lot of times, they're agitated because they feel out of control and they don't believe anything we're telling them. Yeah. And so it's it's listening and coming back with a better plan. I will never come out with a plan. And every one of my competitors has to do it their own way. Um, a lot of them believe come in with a more dense and less likable plan so that they can come back to what they really wanted and make it look like a witch. And I won't do that. Okay. And so um, there are projects that I think should have worked, but because of the factors that we talked about earlier before we started today, they're just not in the right location. The constituents just can't get on board. The timing isn't right. There's a lot of reasons and we have to work with the cities going forward on other projects. And so if we know that that is not going to work, we will sit on a project or we will work from the project. So that, that's perfect. Um, you dealt with that mayor in Devon where um, a project was not approved and um, it was, you got some, some press on it that might not have been the most positive and there's always two sides to every story. So share a little bit about that. Yep. Uh, not positive press is a really <laughs> nice way to It was it. very we, tactful. We got hammered in the, uh, in the newspaper and there was really just a portion of the information that was put out of, uh, of a specific site where multifamily, in fact, it was an affordable um, product that was that was contemplating coming in. And initially it came in as that very high density, I think they were 16 to 18 uh, per, per acre, 16 dwelling units per acre. Uh, the, the, um, the difficulties with that specific site were, uh, one, it did not fit in our general plan. You have a uh, uh, basically normal right across the street that's been acre lots uh, in the county for the longest amount of time. And uh, and then you had brand new residential that went in around it that were about four dwelling units per acre. So that lower to mid density single family home residential development. So it was difficult to make it work within the general plan. Uh, and then it was in that loop graduated density or, or concept uh, and and just didn't really fit there either, the, the densities that they were talking about. So we try to, and we run everything in the city of Buckeye through Care for Space to make sure that we're not stepping on uh, the good work that they're doing out there. And we never ever want to uh, put the base at risk by projects that are happening in the city of Buckeye. So we're happy to say, no, it doesn't work if it's going to negatively affect Luke and, and the mission. Maybe not today, but long term. Sure. Um, and then uh, you're right. There, there is some nimbyism related to uh, multifamily. Uh, we had, I have never received more phone calls or emails about anything uh, as a either a councilman or a mayor over the last 12 years than we did about that specific project. Then. And some of them just, uh, it's, uh, it's those people, not the, who are the people in the neighborhood. And, uh, and then the, the, uh, the others were bringing up some really good points like, hey, wait a minute, I didn't move here to be next to 16 to 18 dwelling units per acre. This is a horrible setting. Uh, I, but this is on Jackrabbit Trail. What are you going to do for traffic on Jackrabbit Trail when well, there's no real solution there? Um, and and so there were some really good points being made by quite a few of them. So it's kind of the trifecta with that. You can't go and support that as a as an elected body. And uh, and we ask, is there anywhere else in 640 square miles within the city of Buckeye that we can put you in there? There wasn't, and I think it had something to do with uh, uh, incentives uh, that they were getting for the affordability gotcha. from the federal government because of that specific area. Uh, and, and it just didn't work. And so the, the, at that time, there were a couple other municipalities that were considering that same. Uh, and, and it was a beautiful project. Uh, aesthetically, very good. The plan was great. Uh, we really liked it. Someplace else within the city of Buckeye. And then, of course, the newspaper gets hold of it. And we get trashed in the paper uh, about that specific one. 
not taking into account that there are currently today 8,000 units of multifamily that are working themselves through the pipeline of the city of Buckeye. Wow. 800 of those are uh, affordable housing. So there is not a, uh, there's not a reluctance from, at least from the city of Buckeye to put that type of housing product in. And that, that's all over the place from affordable to luxury, and, uh, you know, to the, uh, the built to rent type stuff, uh, the, uh, the garden style, all of it. So there's room for all of it within the city of Buckeye. So we're very excited to get that type of housing product. Uh, I think what, what we're really working on and we need to work on together as uh, government and uh, developer is speed the market and how we get these projects to market faster to meet the demand so that we don't have any hitches in economic development. It used to be that we did, housing was easy right. and, <laughs> uh, and we just had housing and we knew that 90% of our population drove east on I-10 to get to jobs. Now, uh, now housing is an issue. And, and we've got to figure out how to get more housing. So the concentration was really on job uh, projects. Now that's kind of balanced out to where, yes, we want all of those job projects, but we need to get housing in to support those job projects. So housing is not second fiddle uh, as it has been for the longest time. Yeah, housing and transportation. And we just got a question about schools. So yeah. how are you all working together when you know, there's obviously it's it's not an age restricted community, and, and you have your demographic for sure. But um, how does schools play into this on not both the city side and the development side? I know obviously you're not in charge of schools, but you definitely have a close working relationship with your school districts. Yeah, so on every site that we do, um, we we actually end up with very few children in our communities, um, but we recognize that. It's a, it's a, well, our product is called the village. It takes a village, right? We all need to take care of everything and be involved in everything. So we actually, right out of the gate, when we're working with the municipalities, um, start working with the school districts right away. We'll enter into development agreements and actually pay in our parada share based on even the same as what they would be paying in per um, home developed for a single family purchase. So all of our developments are actually paid for through that same formula. So, and actually brings in more money than a typical housing. You know, usually a, a single family housing is, you know, three to four units per acre and, and we're coming in at 10 and a half. So at that number of units at a thousand dollars plus a door, um, that actually helps the school districts as well. To making sure they can service. Yeah, I think from the city perspective, we try and run, or we don't try to, we run everything past the school district so they understand what type of housing product is coming in. The, the general plan contemplates varied residential from low density residential to higher density multifamily. And, uh, and then there are demographics and, and, and as markets change too, and this, the single family or the, the built to rent becomes more and more predominant, uh, there, there's probably going to be some changes in schools and how they uh, fund or how we move quicker to fund some of these schools that are going to be necessary probably sooner rather than later based on yeah um i i've been sharing this story quite a bit with the team recently um but over 20 years ago working with the city of surprise um the dysart school district didn't know what was coming in you know and so they were they couldn't be prepared at the time um because the community at that time was largely retirement so projects are coming in and it just say you know everybody's going you didn't tell me this you know, why aren't you doing better? And it was just really sitting down and sharing information and it has transformed to Dysart's now one of the highest performing or high performing school district in the city. So just that simple sitting down and talking about things. And so so back to kind of the, some of the phone calls, if you're getting these phone calls and you know how your community feels about a project, you're you're making thoughtful decisions, you know, you're looking at Okay, what was real and what's just kind of crazy out there? Um, and how do you then start working with the with the developer? Um, is it and how do you both work with each other? You know, because you you've got to cover the elected official to an extent. You're you're kind of working in the same um, area. So how has that worked? And any tips for any communities out there? 
I think it's uh, flexibility, in, in, especially in the development. And without a doubt, every development that is coming in that we talked to, even the one that, that didn't happen, they met with the community and the community said, we don't like three-story buildings right on our fence line. You need to change that. So then they reworked the plan to move those, make them two-story and then and then the higher dense stuff out toward the, uh, the main roadways. Um, but it's working with the, the residents to to fix some of those issues or mitigate the impact of the, the development as it comes in. And, and we see that all the time. In fact, we approved a, uh, a unit at Watson and uh, Yuma in Buckeye behind the fries uh, that is a couple hundred to 240 or 250 units, a piece of desert that's between fries and homes that have been there for 15 years now. They met with the, the neighbors and and, uh, and they found out ways to mitigate that that impact of taller buildings. Uh, you don't want them looking right down in you know, somebody's right. backyard. Uh, and so they're they're taking steps to to fix some of that stuff and listening. Developers that we work with are listening to the the city and the, the community okay. to make sure because it, it it's not going to be fun if. If you all move in and everybody hates that project because you're those people that didn't listen to what they said, you want to be a good neighbor and, and come in and, and we can all get along. That's the sandbox. And same thing. I mean, listening and really understanding to your point of what's a real complaint and what's just noise. someone noise. Yeah. And so once we figure out the real complaint, it's really listening and figuring out sometimes it's reducing the height. We do all one story. Um, we can increase our buffer. We can maybe put um, some landscape open space back there. We can maybe put a street back there instead. And so we really listen to what their real concerns are. I have been on sites before where traffic, it's always traffic. Traffic was a concern. And what we were taking out was actually producing more traffic than what we would be producing. Um, but they still had concerns and they didn't believe us that the number, you know, they, they referred to the traffic study as a voodoo science. And the next thing I know, we were buying the school sites. There were two private school sites on either side of our development um, at each corner. And we we had to delay our project almost a year so that they could um, they were willing to sell and were happy to, to relocate at the price we were um, negotiated with them. And so we gave them that entire school year to find a new location and reopen their school. And then the numbers really went down. The real issue was uh, the pickup and drop off times and the backup. And so buying those two schools and relocating them to another area, right up. They were right on um, Cactus and Scottsdale. It was, it was just, a, it was a, was a challenge. So we've, we've done that. We have um, worked through, like I said, amenities. Um, we had someone complain about, they, they were afraid that if our trash cans were too close for pickup, that they'd hear the trucks in the morning. Um, and you know, it was one of the only neighbors that actually came and talked to us we said, you know what, what, why, what can we do? And we ended up actually from that site forward, getting rid of all of our trash pickup areas and added in valet trash and recycle through all of our communities and um, have the trash compactor in one location um, far away with noise and odor control. Um, so people don't see it or even smell it. And it's one pickup. It's usually from the outside of the community. So we don't even have the trash truck within the community and away from the neighbors. And so it is really listening. And that is insanely yeah. accommodating, by the way. That's but you know what our tenants love it. They put their trash and their recycle out on their front yeah. porch at eight p.m. every night, and we come around and pick it up. Yeah, that's a good. Have you ever allowed residents outside to come in their dogs? Oh, we yeah. have not. Sounds like some termite one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, dog room will loose down the street, but yeah. every now and then shower in between. So yes. you know. Awesome. I think there was a question about water that came up. Let me just go back to that. So water is a very important concern. Uh, what might be the magnitude of landscape water savings with multifamily projects um, over a uh, single family? Um, you know, I mean, that's a great question. I don't know that there is a savings. Um, I think that we use a lot less water. Um, in these communities and in most developments than people realize. Um, we use less water now in the West Valley than we did 30 years ago, even with all of the growth. And that's through our recharge programs and our cert, um, just replenishing our, our groundwater and, and the infrastructure that we all put in. We, we put underground tanks in 
all of our sites and capture every ounce of the runoff water from our site and actually hold it underground um, and have dry wells down to the runoff water system. And so um, obviously low usage um, water plants and we put in um, artificial turf and pavers in the backyards of every unit, um, make sure that it's low watering trees that are required. But I think you see that now um, in all of our developments, whether it be single family, commercial, um, the Taiwan plant, for example, they use a ton of water, but they're reusing every ounce of that water. And so water is very important and it's a huge problem that we all need to be conscious of and work together to uh, manage. Um, but I do think like a lot of things, the media has taken nationwide this issue and has made it a lot harder than it, it, than it is. I think the West Valley is in a really good position right now and has been because of back in the 70s and 80s planning for this. We were planning for this drought. A lot of residents don't understand that. So we, we already were prepared for this drought. And so all of that is being well managed. Um, I just think it's another issue in the media that gets spun out of control. Good. It seems like you've got your arms around the whole water situation and in terms of um, knowledge also. Thank you. Yeah. So yes, on um, we made some really good decisions back in the 70s and 80s and yeah. uh, put ourselves in, in really good shape. And, uh, part of that was the CAP and, and bringing that new water source in, which is one of those big outside the box thinking projects for the Metro Phoenix area. It's going to morph into a water conversation here real quick. I'll try to do that. But the, the, the trick now is for that ultimate growth we're going to see over the next 20 to 100 years is figuring out what that next outside the box source is. Okay. CAP fuel growth over the last 40 years. And, um, and, and we still have some, some bandwidth for growth, but uh, for that long-term Growth, we, we need to figure out what that next supply is so we can continue um, with some outstanding projects. I think uh, it, it depends also on the type of, of um, water that, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, the type of multifamily we're talking about. So the, the build to rent type stuff has maybe more open space than some of the uh, garden style. Right. And when you start to go vertical, you have lot less of that outdoor water use that uh, you would see in that typical single family residential unit. The, the vast majority of water that we use in residential is outside. Uh, so, so these projects not only uh, are maybe more efficient at how they're delivering water and then you have a professional landscaper that is managing that water throughout that, that uh, paint to rent development. Uh, but when you get these, um, garden style, the two, three, four story buildings that have limited landscape outside um, and, and that's managed by a professional company that you don't have quite, I, I think it's drastically less water that you're using outside ultimately. So probably good for the water portfolio. Good, good. So let's talk a little transportation, which is I think our favorite topic, yes, right? Absolutely. So you have a school going in on uh, Buck on Jack Rapid. Yes, ma'am. And um, so there's a lot of traffic. And so you put more multifamily housing, you put all that stuff. How does that, I mean, you already have a nightmare going on. So um, what do you mean? <laughs> I, I drive that road from Indian school to, to about Rose Belt or just one that's on. And uh, and it is a big issue right now, and it's a, it's a complex roadway because you have the interchange that needs to be uh, basically rebuilt for the, the capacities. It's the only interchange that is not complete or will be complete between Phoenix and uh, basically uh, State Route 85. Uh, and, in fact, you still have stop signs off on the on and off ramps. Yes. yes, I did it once. Right, and and <laughs> I <need to> <laughs> <my own channel. laughs> never again. Uh, and and there's multiple jurisdictions ownership along that roadway, so we're trying to figure out the funding sources for improving from Indian School all the way to Maple. And that that school just becomes great hearts. They're going to do wonderful stuff down there. 
that building is really starting to take shape and, and they're an outstanding school. Yes. Um, so you start loading that traffic on uh, the city through a development uh, reimbursement agreement will add Roosevelt through from from where Summit Church and, and the new, not allowed to say the name, uh, but starts with the C, rhymes with an O, and, and <laughs> sounds like Costco. Uh, from from that area through to uh, 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 basically from Broadway, taking Roosevelt from Broadway to Jack River Trail. Traffic signal there, a uh, great tie in, but that hasn't done anything to improve the capacity along that corridor. So, Senator Kerr has done outstanding work in, in running a bill through the legislature that hopefully will bring, fingers crossed, we should know here in two weeks, uh, $20 million to that corridor uh, to approve Jackrabbit Trail. We are putting in a match. The county has indicated. Uh, that they want to participate somehow, and, uh, and we are already in at least the design concept group with ADOT to interchange. Uh, and so we think that the funding is starting to come through and we'll make some changes in that corner that improves that commute and starts to build from that ultimate condition. Um, Prop 400 extension would help solve a lot of that. In fact, the funding for the Interchange construction itself comes from Prop 400 extension. Uh, if that does not get passed, we do not have money for transportation in uh, not only the West Valley, but the entire South Maricopa County. Uh, so it is vitally important to get that for areas like Jackrabbit Trail, but uh, there's areas in Surprise to be talking about, or Glendale, or Goodyear, Avondale, Peoria, that need transportation funding to improve transportation opportunities for people. I-10 has to have that state route 30 relief. Or we'll be going uh, starting here very soon from 303 to 202. And we're hopeful that we can get the uh, the section from 303 to 85 complete, uh, which which will alleviate some of the traffic from the uh, core power here from the uh, 40 million square foot of industrial that is uh, that is going in the bucket. You know, um, a lot of people, I know we're getting deep into transportation now, but it's this topic. Um, but uh, one of the things that people look at or think initially is that SR30 is a West Valley project, when in fact it's an Arizona project because Buckeye being the first point of entry into the state, into the metro area, um, whether and we were seeing projects land in, in the East Valley and Mesa and in Eloy, but if you look at the map, they all have to come through I-10 exactly and then figure out where they're going next. So SR30 is really a statewide it, project. And it, it relieves that hard rate for commerce between Arizona. And yes. it is widely important. A lot of the projects that come in uh, to Arizona, or at least to the West Valley, are projects that are citing here because that drive time to the, the ports and back uh, can take place within a uh, the time frame the truckers are allowed to drive each day. And uh, if it's clogged up, that changes that time frame, and you are uh, not able, you're not as uh, not as efficient, and it's not as ideal location to, to come to. So, State Route 30 is vitally part of the overall Prop 400 extension that have to get past. Yeah, time is money. Yes, ma'am. So awesome. Speaking of time, we're down to like the last few minutes. So anything else that we did not discuss or that you would like to, I always like to leave people on three points, right? Like what is the key thing that you want them to, to think about? Um, and I know we didn't really talk about uh, workforce housing or affordable housing. We talked more about just in general multifamily housing. Um, but if we free up some of the very limited multifamily housing options out there, affordable housing with these different products, then we're able to backfill a little bit on the on the workforce housing. So any thoughts or anything? Um, no, I just think we have our work cut out for us. There's a lot to still be built and there's a lot to still overcome. It's education, getting people comfortable with the shortage that we're in right now. 
understanding it's not just people moving into the valley, it's people wanting to stay in the valley, um, but it's also part of this economic engine that we've created, which is a fantastic thing. Arizona is a great place to live. Uh, we all love living here, most of us anyway, and um, a lot of people are transplants here, and we're going to continue to see that. We are morphing just like everybody with the changes. We didn't talk about COVID today at all, which has been nice and not talking about that. But that's also affected a lot of what we're doing. There's, it's changing a lot of approach in um, our business, whether it be um, traffic patterns. Traffic patterns aren't so much just in the morning and at night anymore. People are working from home. And so we see a, a big influx during the day at lunch hour, um, people leaving home to go work out. Or, and so just trying to really work with not only the cities, um, but with our traffic engineers and with everyone in the community right now to understand what that looks like. Um, and for people that are seeing all of this development, thinking this is a bubble or we're in another, we're going to have another um, housing crisis, that's not the case. This is very different from the recession. Um, we didn't talk about that today either. Um, 2007, 8, 9 that we probably all don't want to think of. We're not there. Um, if you, we, we study so many different groups, whether it be with Elliot Pollock, Arcadia, John Byrne, Zonda. We work with all of them and, and just studying the market. We, we may need to, to slow down for a minute and catch up because of the labor force and because of materials, um, but it's just an adjustment. We're not going to see a huge change in that we have to catch up with our housing shortage. And so working together, I think, to figure that out. Yeah, I think, I think it's a big takeaway from, from a Buckeye perspective, 640 square miles, general plan, um, and master plan communities show a lot of what's happening in those different areas. Talk to the public, there's room for all types of product. Just because we're uh, uh, wanting multifamily in for a certain area doesn't mean that the whole city is going to be multifamily. There's going to be, like we said, from uh, from high density to uh, to affordable to executive homes on acre lots or multi-acre lots out there. So tons of opportunity for that. and. There was a figure that we didn't talk about that was staggering. I forgot to mention it. You had a figure of 50,000 right. units, multifamily yeah. units, needed in the, in the West Valley in the next two years? Yes, uh, the next five. The next five. So that's 10. Just thousand. in the West Valley. And that's just the seven uh, the seven West Valley cities that we we looked at with Zonda. And KJ is going to pull that up right now. But that's a good point. Uh, it was a slide that you just passed. 50,319 multifamily units that are anticipated and needed during this projected uh, um, household growth. And that's split. Um, that's just the numbers we came up with from those seven cities listed in the West Valley. That's a staggering thing. Yes. And, and that is just West Valley. We heard a figure the other day from MAG that said 80 plus percent of the growth over the next 20 years yes. is going to be West Valley. Mm -hmm. that is right. That is staggering also. So as this growth happens, what we as a city need to do is figure out how we accomplish that speed to market and get multifamily in as fast as possible. Uh, that supply demand will bring those rents down and uh, it'll be better for everybody. Welcome quality product within West Valley. So very, very excited about that. And, you know, you hit something really important is that Really, it's the diversity of the community, right? So you, we have rural, we have the you know one acre, we have the multi acre plots, we have a lot of single family homes. This is really an element that is missing. It's not, it's it's growing, and people are not used to seeing it. So, which leads us into the marketing effort, and this is why we're doing these topics to to bring it to folks so that they have a better understanding of really what the product is. So you see it going up on the corners or in your community, and it's it's not evil. Um, right. I think the city of Goodyear did a, a tremendous job um, in their community newsletter in featuring who is actually living in those communities and did interviews and put it out in our in our uh, in our monthly newsletter. So that was all the faces of my community and what they actually do for a living. Um, so, I'd like to also up on that, Home AZ. I, I feel like I'm a I should be paid by Home AZ. <laughs> Uh, I think they're on this call. Well, yes. It was just really impressive to hear the numbers that they had. They also did a survey uh, talking to the public about the need for multifamily 
So we have some of these projects that come in, everybody's, no, 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 we don't want multifamily, but they've gone out and surveyed and found that better than 70%, and I don't remember the exact number, realize there is an absolute need for multifamily to be built sooner rather than later uh, because of the affordability issue in, in homes. And so they've got some outstanding data that, that can help to, uh, I can work through some of the, the details that are associated with Awesome. Well, thank you both for sharing your time and your knowledge. And we always like to hear what's going on in your communities and how we're delivering this message to our uh, to our constituents. So appreciate you all for uh, tuning in and joining us today for West Valley Hot Topics. Um, our next um, feature will be on uh, Class A office space in the West Valley. And that's something that we've all been wanting for a long time and working really hard on. And so we'll hear from Globe Corporation and the um, uh, Joe uh, Mayor Pazillo, Joe Pazillo, the uh, mayor of the city of Goodyear, talking about that great project coming into uh, into Goodyear, serving all of the West Valley. So join us in August, and thanks again for joining us today.